Hey, right here, dude. Over here. By the tree. What's up? Oh, shit. Oh, snap. Now I'm over here by this tree. Oh, what? Major editing skills, dude. What's up? Hey, guys. Let's talk about some research. Video game research. There's a lot of it in this industry. Some people make money on researching alone. For example, a company called Li uh, Liquid and Grit that I know of, probably some of the best decks I've ever seen. And they can be extremely useful. And companies, I feel they want to feel the need of research. So they kind of put a research department in companies like as if it's just a necessary part of like the building blocks of a company. They say, I need a PM. I need a HR, I need a design team, I need a marketer, and I need a, a researcher, a content lab, or analysis team, or a research department. And that's all really good. I wanted to talk about that a little bit and give you some, uh, um, some of my opinions on that, and then we'll jump into some research. Basically, research is sometimes used as like a, huh. Let's try it again, a car drove by. What happens is people generally research games and they have these brilliant teams, these people who are super good at making uh, these decks. And these decks are filled with basically glorified bullet points of mini paragraphs and a lot of screenshots to describe specific features of a video game so that when they present it to a specific team or an executive team or somebody who's in a position to make decisions, they can be educated better kind of like cliff notes for a book. And what happens is a lot of times this information is being given to people who actually don't understand the philosophy of free to play. What they take in is the basics. So someone might show them uh, show somebody a very nice deck and often more and more and more executives don't actually make games and more and more and more every day we have people who are really good at business we really need these people they, they raise money they're super good at getting a company moving but they're not as strong in game design or game building or game making in this case that some of these things get a little lost let me explain so if somebody comes up to a bunch of guys a marketer guy you know a pm chick and this studio lead and he says this particular game here's the research the deck has says that it's a it's a very skill-based game it has customizable characters it has um vip and it has live events and everyone will say, oh, okay, cool, right? And the meeting ends and they go back and people become extremely knowledgeable in the gaming industry. They start to understand the lingo. And then their, their next game, they start to wonder, does this have, oh, this game has customizable characters. It must be good. Or we should probably put VIP in our game because it works for them. But the philosophy behind these features is lost. Recently, a game maker's fan emailed uh, Joseph and I, and he said he felt burnt out in free to play because he had been working it for a couple years and it felt like a big money grab and he was personally just feeling a little burned out and i get it and this is where i think some of that starts to happen we start to wonder how to make our game better we research so i've been a little weary about research for a while and i kind of stay away with away from it and i'll get into that um, to some extent i stay away from it so now these guys and these people these women these men they know about vip but they don't understand the philosophy behind VIP. So they can walk around and knowing it's useful for a game, but every game is extremely different and it doesn't always work for every game. So having this research is useful, but the, the way in which it is applied is, is, is even more important. Uh, like I said in a previous video, uh, I'll use it again because it's so good. Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, he says, knowledge is only potential power, right? It, being able to put that knowledge into practical plans to the definite end is the real power in having that knowledge. Like for example, the philosophy of VIP is you have points that are in an in-app transaction. It adds more value to an in-app transaction. It makes it more desirable and it's always there. 
you, the user can count on this being there every single time. And when they purchase an in-app transaction, it then goes to another menu in which there's many tiers and there's boosts inside these tiers and these boosts become more strong as they level up their VIP. Now these boosts have to work in harmony with the game design or else it really doesn't matter. And generally a, a good VIP system from what I have seen, studied and, and learned through experience is that it helps out okay in the beginning. It starts to make a pretty good impact in the middle of, the, of your game experience. And towards your end game, when you're really kicking ass, VIP becomes extremely useful. And those who have been around a while, who have gotten the holiday sales, the Christmas sales, have a higher VIP than others. And now we have a really strong VIP philosophy that's actually working. Now, it's not impossible to make a deck that explains this, but it's often not the case. This says VIP and it says users get points and it goes towards a boost page. And everyone says, okay, I get it. But they kind of don't sometimes. Even though I've worked on many VIPs, recently I was working on a VIP feature with an economist named Jeff Witt and I cannot recommend Jeff Witt enough. He's one of the best economists in the industry that I know of to date. He's one of those rare game makers who have, has had some, some, some success, some well-deserved success, but remain humble and teachable and active in the industry. So I'm working on this VIP and I know I'm gonna arrive at the feature, so I start designing the menu, but then I realize some boosts are also in items, some boosts are also in some other areas, and it's starting to become too overpowering, so I'm deciding what boosts should go where, and they're fighting each other for, for space. And we had to work extremely hard for a week, me and Jeff, to figure it out. And between two of our, both of our expertise, we actually came to a solution. But it was kind of trouble in the water. I was about to lose a VIP feature, and the only reason I felt like I needed it was because it was on a feature list, and hey, research says we should do it. So. That's a really good example of how research should say you should do something, but you might arrive that it actually won't even matter or it actually can't work for your game. And unless you can really, really make it work, then you start to lose its free to play true art form where everything works really well. Like Clash Royale, for example, my nephew has been playing it for years and he hasn't spent a dime, but Clash Royale is still a top grossing app. And so that's an extremely difficult task to execute you know free to play is not a money grab it's a very complicated piece of art that allows the customer to decide how much they're willing to spend while still being successful very very hard to do and so when we're taking in this research and we want our game to be that we want it to be a complicated piece of art with the ability to allow the customer to decide how much they want to spend and still be successful we want to shove the features in that will work and sometimes it doesn't happen uh, it doesn't work out and then free to play starts to look a little funny so i think that that problem kind of roots from the research and then it goes to positions of power in which it might not be able to be interpreted or or executed as properly and then we have a broken system so you know we have companies that spend millions of dollars on research take zynga for example I'm not here to talk about their success or lack of success but we can agree that they probably spend a lot of money on research so when we have a medium-sized team and we're putting all this extra funding into research what makes us think that we're actually going to come up on top i mean zynga doesn't have like eight top grossing apps right now you think they would know and maybe having a top grossing app isn't the, the creme de la creme, but we are all trying to make one game at a time and we want to make a game that works really well. So if research was the answer, then why is it, doesn't it always work? In my opinion, it's because we need to understand the philosophy behind features and how they work in harmony with the game as a whole. I've been researching personally for a while uh, and I do it one way almost every single time. And it's kind of a style that's meant for somebody who's actually going to make games and make decisions. I, I don't often put my research into a deck. Um, I usually just do it for myself personally. And so when I see specific features or when I want to figure out a game, I usually start in a certain place and I end in a certain place. And it's worked with, for me over 10 years of experience. And I've worked on some, you know, pretty heavy hitters. So I'd like to think that I, I kind of know how to do it. And there's a plenty of analysis. There's professional uh, researchers out there and I'm sure they do a phenomenal job. But when we want to just do what works, when we want to do something that's useful for us on our own time, I have a way in which I'd like to share with you that I think is actually extremely useful. 
Um, and this is my entire process on how to research a game effectively so it's useful for your entire career, not just for the moment, and how to harness those special features and possibly understand the philosophies behind them so you can put them in your game and actually use them well and have a better outcome in the end. So let's go to the desk and I'll show you how I do it. All right guys, so we're here at the desk. I'm gonna show you a little bit about how I research. We're in a very humble location. It's very nice and beautiful here, so you may hear some birds chirping. But before I open a game, I most of the time review it before I even get to it, before I even open the app. And when I open the app, I hold that moment very sacredly, so I usually record it because the first time user experience is hard to capture when um, you don't. like try for it because oftentimes the games these days remember who you are so next time you log in it recognizes your id of some sort and it keeps you at the last spot you were so you can't experience the tutorial over and the tutorial is so so important and you build a big arsenal of video tutorials and it's super useful later but we'll get into that first what we're going to do is we're going to go to the computer and i'll show you what i do to research a game so the first thing i do is i go to app annie and i generally read straight to the what's new. And in this case, I have already opened up the page and I've uncollapsed all the what's news. And this may look like a simple technique, but it's actually really interesting. You know, as soon as I see something start to repeat, like for example, this says King's Tower, go ahead and take King's Tower, Command C, Command F, and then I press Command V and it pops up and I can see, okay, they're adding a lot of floors to this King's Tower. You know, I'm, I should be interested in that. I do this with things that are a little bit more obscure. Other things that I understand, like adding new heroes, we see that a few times more towards the bottom, adding new heroes. Chapters, I'm not sure what that is. Quests, I'm fairly familiar with that. We'll see what they mean by that. Some aesthetics, so some vanity. And towards the top here, they're really, really changing the game. They did King's Tower a lot. And then up here, I could see some things that are just really new to me. Me, a new competitive feature. This is unique to the game. This is unique to the game. It's not a feature that you can just say is common free to play, which is used all over the place, like added VIP. I'm not sure what this is, but they're really going heavy in this now. And that is pretty much all I'll do on this page. I will check the top charts. In this case, this is the rank history, top grossing, and I did the last 90 days, which you select it right here and it shows me that this game is doing really, really well. After that, what I usually do is I YouTube the game. Companies spend um, a lot of money on how a game looks, and this is like a first time look of the game. So this guy's gonna show us all about the game, and uh, I'm sure it'll be pretty detailed. And I'll scroll through all of the first looks, and I'll see how it's received. A lot of people, you know, they wanna know how good a game is, and you don't have to look far for that. Again, very simple. Something that's not so simple that I do, that I think is kind of special, is I always search for a game's hacks. Because I have worked with companies in the past where they are selling us a game, they say, hey, check out this game, it's really cool, and I wanna review their product, and sure, you can write a big deck on it. You could say, hey, it's got these features, it's good or bad. But one time I was in a meeting and I told the guy, sure, your game looks beautiful, it's really fun. Can you tell me more about the hack and where people can win no matter what, just, just like that? And he was like, yeah, about that. And I was like, yeah, tell us about that. So they had some backend things that they weren't really strong at and they could be stronger at and people were taking advantage of their product. And when somebody takes advantage of a free to play game, the community hates it and revenue is really, really hit hard by that. So the first couple things that I showed you that I read the what's news and I find common, you know, common things that are happening in the what's new. And then I'll check out the grossing area and then I'll check out how it's received on YouTube and then I'll check out the hacks. Now, pretty simple, right? I'm not building a deck here. I'm not trying to give this to an executive. I'm not trying to educate everyone else on it. Now I'm like aware of things that are really strong with the game and things that are also really wrong with the game and what people are trying to do to overcome it and trying to beat it because a good community will always try to hack your game. After I've done all this, I'll put this away and then I'll launch what is called QuickTime with my phone plugged in to my computer. Um, usually what happens is, let me try that one more time. I'll go to File, New Movie Recording. So one of these um, cameras are gonna turn on and it might be facing me. This freaks a lot of people out. They're like, oh no, 
What are you doing? I come down here and I select my phone, which is titled Lawless. And then now my phone will be um, mirrored on the screen. Very, very good tool to use for presentations in a company. You'd be surprised, there's a lot of apps like Reflector or Mirror, or there's even AirPlay, but this is actually a really handy, unique, like tricky way of kind of showing people the game and it's completely real time since it's plugged into your computer. Now I'm using a MacBook Pro. If you're the type of person who uses a PC, I worked with the guy before and I think he figured a way out, but I really don't know what to tell you PC guys. Just figure it out. You PC guys are smart, so you'll figure it out. Now we're gonna play the game for the first time and I'm gonna go ahead and hit record. Sometimes, I have trouble figuring this out. Let me know if you do. You can actually get the microphone to go into the game and now it should be recording the music of the game. Sometimes I forget to do that. No big deal. Music is not like always the highest priority and you can capture that much easier than, a free, than, a, than an experience. So now we have it recording my, uh, my screen and it's recording the sound, so I'll press record. So it's recording, so now I'll play the game for about 30 or 45 minutes and just enjoy it. And I'll just let this do its thing. So let's get started. We've got about 45 minutes of footage and um, we're gonna move to the next step. So if you take a look at my computer with me, let's check it out. So what we have here is we actually have two recordings uh, kind of on accident. I was uh, interrupted and the recording stopped, but usually I have one, but it's okay. We have about six minutes on this side and over here we have about 34 minutes. This is actually kind of cool because on one end we have the tutorial, the full tutorial on everything they did through the tutorial, we could just scrub through it really easy. So you could see why these videos are really useful. And over here we have a very long drawn out, about 35 minutes of gameplay. So just bear with me while I go ahead and take screenshots of these. And then we're gonna move on to the next step, which is harvesting images. A lot of people, what they do is they take pictures of their phone and they try to, uh, send their photos via email or airdrop them somehow. And it's this big mess. Your phone has hundreds of screenshots and it's, it's not really nice. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna resize these to a more uh, suitable size, something smaller, because we're gonna take a bunch of screenshots. And now I'm going to jump into the part in which I'm gonna take a many different screenshots from this that are kind of key areas and uh, we're not gonna be too judgmental of what we do. We're just gonna try to get a lot of it, but we're not gonna be too, too um, anal about what we choose. So let's, let's harvest some screenshots. All right, so we got a lot of screenshots now. Um, more than we need, really. A lot of key screens, and we got a lot of, uh, we got to see the game in, fro in freeze mode, so we kind of understand it even deeper. So now, before we do anything with these screenshots, let's go ahead and compress these videos so they don't take up a lot of space. Usually what I do is I open up a cheap compressor that I got from the App Store. This, this is the one I use, Video Compressor. Go ahead and click that, open it up, and uh, we, we don't need these open anymore. We'll close them. We're gonna drag in the tutorial. We're about go about half the KBPS. We're gonna get it really low, maybe like around here, it's fine. Just compress that. We'll call this um, AFK tutorial. All right, so we compressed the files so we save space on our computer because we're gonna, you're gonna be researching a lot of games over the, over the course of your career, so we don't want that uh, to, to clog you up there. So now we're gonna go over to my screen again and we're gonna do the next step. So let's get rid of these guys. These are the ones that are not compressed. Let's just move these to trash. And we're gonna create a folder for this game called AFK Arena. And we're gonna drag everything in here now. This is easier to do all this if you have a nice clean desktop. 
All right. So now we got everything in one folder and we're going to move on to the next step, which is something I call making a brick. Now having screenshots is super useful. We have them all the time. Take screenshots here, take screenshots there. It's, it, it gets kind of messy. You know, we got to admit, it, what, are the, what are we doing with all these things? So this is something I call a brick and I make it and I save it and I never change it and I always keep it. And I, I, use a, I use a program called Illustrator to do it. It's my main program that I work in. So let's open Illustrator and I'll show you how to make a brick. So we're gonna open up Illustrator. We're just gonna open up any canvas here. We've got a nice big blank canvas. And then we're going to open this up really big and we're gonna make a huge canvas. Okay, so this takes a little bit of art skills, but this is your canvas button. But if you're really determined to do a good job on your research, this should be pretty easy. So I'm gonna zoom out. And then we're gonna take our screenshots and we're gonna drop them all in. So the cool part about this is that our screenshots are probably in order because we, when you take screenshots on the computer, it does it by timestamp. So the first one we took is the first one and the last one we took is the last one. So we're just gonna grab all of these and we're gonna drag them on to Illustrator. And just let go. So here's all of our screenshots. Now, how to make a brick. So you're gonna to wanna to use your rulers. So go ahead and Command R, get your rulers there. Command R on a Mac, I'm not sure what it is on a PC. We're gonna resize these to a small size that's still kind of legible. It's a little bit too small, a little bit bigger. Mm, a little bit smaller. Okay, cool. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out our ruler, go out to the very end of it, and we're gonna make a space about this big. And then we're gonna grab one, we're gonna, and it's gonna snap onto the end nice and easy, and you're gonna grab, you're gonna hold down shift, grab the next one, and then pull, pull them over. We're gonna do this all the way until every single one is making a giant kind of brick-like building. Usually I only go over about five or six, but today we're gonna, actually, let's just do what I usually do. So once you reach this one, you go down, grab a ruler, mark your down, mark your, uh, your down. So then you can be clean. So now we're gonna fast forward. I'm gonna show you how to make this brick. All right, so we made a brick. Here is almost every screen in the game perfectly laid out. Now we're gonna save this to our FK Arena brick and we're going to save it to this afk arena file so now that we have the brick we have a still of every single screenshot in the game now this is a lot of work but you know when you do an outstanding job you get outstanding results you do a mediocre job you get mediocre results normal job you get a normal result so if you're doing normal research then you're just getting normal results this is um, a quite an extensive way to pull screenshots but it's extremely useful in the long run and you're going to make a lot of games in your career so it's really nice to build this kind of library now all of these screenshots i could use in a different file that i'm going to make and I'm going to point out all the things about it that are special. Now, this is the last step of my research and it's super critical because it forces me to point out every feature that I could recognize to the best of my ability and kind of be with it for a while. And if anyone were to ask me about this game, I could pull out this other area where I kind of annotate every single feature in the game with just small words, not many par like not very many big, not very big paragraphs. And I just kind of just show that uh, this huge canvas of the game. It's really good for me. It's a super strong exercise. And um, that's, that's where I basically end. So let's jump in and I'm going to go ahead and start annotating this and looking at some of these features in more details. But you never, ever touch the brick. Keep the brick just like that. Sometimes I used to start working with the brick and checking out stuff. And then later on, I wish I had the screenshot. 
So if we look back at our computer, we have a massive brick. We have a um, really nice folder here full of everything that we need. We have tutorial to scrub through really fast. You know what I'm saying? Oh, wait, sorry, this is the tutorial. And um, we have a lot of screenshots. And we can reference this forever, forever. So this is extremely useful. Plus, if you check out AFK Arena two years from now and their tutorial is still the same, you know that their tutorial is working very well. So we kind of have like a snapshot in time. But now let's work on the annotation. So we're all done. Why the annotation is kind of nice is because you're just kind of running through, and I whipped that out really fast, but you're just kind of running through some of your thoughts so that if somebody were to ask you what you feel about the, the game and you wanted to talk about it, you'd have something to reference and it'd be all these things like pointing at different things, kind of drawing these big conclusions. Um, so now that we're done, you know, what, what now? Usually the research is well, we have to, the game is actually much larger, so people would go even further. So I'll be playing it as the days go by, which is totally normal. And usually I'll play a game until I dislike it. But sometimes I try to keep liking it, even if I don't like it. Because as we get older in the industry, I think it's important that we try to remain youthful. Like, for example, many of us give up on Snapchat just because we go, ah, Snapchat's not for me. But a lot of people use Snapchat. You should try to get into it. So I'm going to try to get really into it. And I'm going to save these, uh, all these, uh, in one folder. And I'll have my brick, I'll have my annotations, I'll have videos on it. I'll be able to use those videos to show people uh, slow motions of certain fight mechanics if we get into that. Or I could use it to kind of just paint a picture of something that's much larger. Um, so what do I think of the game? Usually this research would go to somebody and they would probably make a decision of, of like just their learnings or read over the deck to learn it and scroll through it or something like that. But now that I've done it, I wanted to kind of run down of what my, generally, my general feelings of it and I'll splice some of the footage in there and show you what I'll take away from this game personally. And um, let's just jump into it. But these are the 10 things about AFK Arena that I found from my research that, I'll, that, I, uh, that is worth, noteworthy. One, I really like the guard wheel guardrail tutorial and how it pushed me back into campaign. Tutorials are super sketchy sometimes when engineers build them. Engineers generally don't like building them. They're always on rails. This game kind of gives you the freedom to poke around, but it keeps telling you, hey man, go keep going this way. I really like that. The hold down to level up was done really well for the heroes. A lot of games have problems with getting rid of currency. I can make a whole video on that. And it's not easy to do it well because free to play is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, there's a fine line between taking too much from the user and helping them. And we want to take currency from the user so that they don't always have it all, right? Like they need to drain the currency. It's like selling a kid a popsicle. You don't want a kid a, to lick the popsicle for two months. You want it to get to the stick eventually. This game gets the kid to the stick real nice and um, there's so many different heroes that it just goes and goes and goes and uh, I, I think that you could constantly be leveling these things up so the hold down to level it up I think was a really good feature um, I love that they did a day two collection that then popped open the rate us app so the day two um, login it says will you rate our app and it does it really well because you're not allowed to ask the user to rate the app for some sort of currency. It has two options. I think one of them, I forget what it said, but it was like praise us and one of them was like critique us or something like that. But both those buttons will lead to the store and they did a really good job. They did a very elegant chat throttle. Chat's a big problem in games. People talk, 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 talk too much. And I also noticed that their chat may be some kind of web base. 
So I think they could control it a lot and that gives them a lot of freedom. And they may have gotten away with a lot of dev time um, by not building their own chat. Maybe they're using a third party, I'm not sure. But either way, the simple things that say like, hey, you have to chat in five seconds or you, or you, or you need to be a certain level or something like that, they're not always as clear to do right. And when we make chat in games, it's just like blah, blah, blah. And then we have to figure out how to throttle it. I thought they did a really nice job at that. Uh, they, hid the, they hid the fact that their game is basically one big menu really well. In the area that's called Ranhorn, an area like this, it has like, it's basically a big glorified menu. When I looked at it, I was like, oh, is this gonna be like this big city? But it was actually just a place where you can press on the guild button, press on the library button, and it was basically just more menus. So they did a super good job at building a really deep game that looks good and kind of masking it with these uh, fun, like saga looking progressional maps. And that is such a really good technique because free to play isn't just about making a great game. It's also about working with the team trying to make an okay game because we all don't have the money to make badass games, but a, okay, but a game with small tech that is really fun. They did it. The main area of the game never changes position. The action of the game is generally like right above, right below your thumb. All your characters are selected from the bottom the main button to play the game is right there in the middle and even all the tabs were lowered because i think they recognize a lot of phones are getting taller so they took this approach to putting most of the buttons towards the bottom of the game and it worked and it's not easy to do that you know a lot of ui guys um, and designers have problems with this we want to put call to actions in the right spot but then there's buttons on the side and on the right and on the top and for the most part everything about their game is in one place and that button is the mega drain of the entire economy. The free gift right below, right above the button was super confusing because there's this big battle above and on the map and I was kind of like, what's going on? I don't think anything's going on. I think it's just an animation to my knowledge because when you press on the chest, it tells you it'll open up in a few minutes and it's basically just a free chest. Um, but the animation is an extreme call to action. It looks like all these things are flying into it and that soon it will be yours. Um, so, again, it's just a nice looking button that opens up a pop-up. It's so good. The fact that each stage has a boss was really cool because bosses aren't easy to do. I've worked with bosses before. They only make sense... <clears throat> well, I think we all understand how bosses work. But think of all the games out there and how many of them have bosses in them right now. Not many. Because a boss is only... It only works well for a game that has stages with a nice, st like a nice solid ending. Like you can't just put a boss in any game. Like there's no boss in Subway Surfers, right? There's no like boss in Candy Crush. So I think they did bosses really well and um, people like bosses, you know? They wanna see this badass guy and they wanna whoop his ass, you know? One thing that I think is, is holding this game together because I don't understand it all the way but heroes lose XP to some degree. They take, they take damage. And the, this exists because they have a really strong auto feature and their auto feature just allows things to just go. And if there was never any like decay to their, to their, to their heroes, then people would just be on auto all time and never ever have a problem and, and not have a fun game to manage. So, Although the auto feature is really solid, what is also really solid is kind of this, you always want to use your best heroes, but by using your best heroes, you'll eventually arrive where you'll have to level up your lower ones. So it does a really good job at like, the philosophies behind this game are really pulling at each other. And it's kind of like, a, you know, it's kind of like a teeter-totter in a way. It's just going back and forth. You're up and you're down, it feels like. and. Other than that, those are some of the key points I had on this game, and I think I'm going to give it a rating. I, I, 1 out of 10, I'm going to say that this game's about probably a strong 7. And for the reasons why is I think they use all the free-to-play features properly. I think it's out of place. Like, the fact that your heroes take damage, it's actually welcomed, and it makes sense to the theme. It's not like your heroes are just dying of sicknesses. The user kind of gets it. Um, and the users even... I had a lot of fun leveling up my heroes really fast and it's fun to actually use this currency that you've earned 
Not a hard, not, not an easy thing to do. I think it doesn't reuse his tech really well. That's why I'm going to give it a seven, a, a strong seven too. It's one mechanic and it's being used uh, quite frequently and the, the developers are able to work on more while what this, the, the smaller areas of things that they built, the main gameplay is very infinite. That is just so useful because what happens is you get in this big race where you're always trying to make something bigger and bigger and better and better. Even subway surfers would have a harder time doing an update in this game in some ways because maybe they have to design a track or something like that and it has to be like fun and different and there's all this like unity or whatever but it feels like in some ways this particular mechanic can be used so many times and it could still have its power that um, it's just pretty cool. Like even if you made it really far in this game, you really wouldn't care because there's just so much more to go. Um, so they really do give you a lot. Oh, another reason why I like this game, the last or final reason, is that the menus were hella simple. They were not tryhards at all. You know, it really shows that some of the old school techniques with like the player profile in the top left hand corner, the username right there, like a settings button, everything was very square and kind of beige. And it looked kind of like something from like five years ago or something like that, but it's not from five years ago, it's here today. And it, it's kind of cool to see that because I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a fan of trying to make games that are like, well, I love games that look great, who doesn't? But it's a lot of work, right? And so I think I just, I just, I just personally, that was a personal thing why I liked it. I like that they can actually make it cool with basic UI. Anyways, that's how I research a game. And um, from here, I'll be able to talk to Joseph about it, no problem. Anyways, later guys. Yeah.